Imagine a time long, long ago when our ancestors roamed the earth. They were artists, artisans, engineers, architects, warriors, navigators, and astronomers. What do they have in common? They all needed geometry to make their dreams come true. Geometry is one of the oldest branches of mathematics because it is all about the properties of objects and space. From measuring lengths to calculating areas and volumes, this field of math was an absolute game changer. Around 300 BC, the legendary mathematician Euclid gave us a gift that would stand the test of time, his masterpiece, Elements. This remarkable work set the stage for the geometry we learn in high school today, and it all started with 10 mighty axioms or postulates. Now, what's an axiom? Think of them as the sacred truths of geometry. Euclid used these five statements as his starting points, things he accepted as self-evident. From these humble beginnings, he weaved a tapestry of knowledge that would influence generations to come. With the power of deductive logic, Euclid and his followers then set out to prove hundreds of theorems. Deductive logic is like a superhero escape for mathematicians. Basically, Euclid's mathematical universe is based on five fundamental postulates. The ability to draw a straight line from any point to any other point, the idea that a finite straight line can be extended continuously in a straight line, the power to describe a circle with any center and distance, and the notion that all right angles are equal to each other is a foundation for understanding angles. But ah, the fifth postulate. It's the rebel of the bunch. It states that if a straight line falls on two other straight lines, forming interior angles on the same side that are less than two right angles, then those lines will eventually meet if extended indefinitely. This postulate was unlike the other four, and Euclid himself wasn't quite satisfied with it. Intriguingly, Euclid tried to avoid using the fifth postulate for as long as possible. He was on a mission to prove as much as he could without relying on this potentially troublesome statement. In fact, the first 28 propositions in the elements are all proven without invoking the fifth postulate. After the time of the great Euclid, many brilliant minds including Greek, Islamic, and later European mathematicians attempted this feat, but none of them ever quite succeeded, even though some thought they had cracked the code. What they often did was craft alternative statements that seemed self-evident, like two parallel lines are equidistant. It was like trying to solve a riddle by replacing one piece with another, equally mysterious puzzle piece. Yet, it led to the birth of two incredible branches of geometry. Farkas Bolyai, a Hungarian mathematician, was driven by an unyielding obsession with proving the parallel postulate. This obsession ran deep in his blood, and he passed it along to his brilliant son, Janos. Yet, after relentless effort and exploration, Janos Bolyai reached a remarkable conclusion. He realized that the parallel postulate was like a mathematical Rubik's Cube that just couldn't be solved. However, instead of throwing it in the towel, Janos Bolyai took a different path. He made a pivotal discovery that would reshape the landscape of geometry. He recognized that the world of geometry could be divided into two groups, one that embraced the parallel postulate and another that dared to question it. He opened the door to non-Euclidean geometry, which shattered the traditional notions of space, unleashing a world of endless possibilities. In 1823, Bolyai penned a paper with a title that's like a thriller novel. Appendix Scientium, Spati Absolute Verum Exhibens, or Appendix Explaining the Absolutely True Science of Space. This paper introduced something mind-blowing, a whole new form of geometry called hyperbolic geometry. Now, what's so cool about hyperbolic geometry is that it ditches the fifth postulate, the one about parallel lines, and replaces it with a daring concept that allows for more than one parallel line through a fixed point. But here's where it gets even more interesting. Janos' dad, Farkas Bolyai, just happened to be friends with none other than Carl Friedrich Gauss, a superstar mathematician of the time. So Farkas proudly sent a draft of his son's paper to Gauss, hoping to get some feedback. Gauss's response was nothing short of astonishing. He told Janos that he had actually come up with a similar system of geometry years before. Yep, Gauss, the math maestro, had independently discovered these same mind-boggling concepts, even though he never published his work. It's like two genius minds on parallel tracks of innovation. Janos Bolyai must have been absolutely floored by this revelation. Here he was, thinking he was venturing into uncharted territory, only to find out that Gauss, one of the greatest mathematicians in history, had beaten him to the punch. 
In the end, the paper was published in 1832 as an appendix to the textbook written by Yanis' dad, Farkas Bolyai. But that was too late. Meanwhile, a professor from the University of Kazan named Lobachevsky unveiled his pioneering work in non-Euclidean geometry in 1829. Lobachevsky's work bore a striking resemblance to that of Janusz Bolyai, but Lobachevsky had absolutely no knowledge of Bolyai's work. Lobachevsky didn't stop at that initial publication. He went on to write several expositions, and it all culminated in his 1855 book, Pangeometry. In the mid-19th century, a true mastermind mathematics named Riemann actually had an eye for the profound implications of non-Euclidean geometry. It all started with Riemann's classic paper, which he penned to secure his admission to the University of Göttingen as a private docent. That's a fancy way of saying he wanted to become an unpaid lecturer, and his livelihood would depend on student fees. The paper was titled Ube die Hypothesen Welsh der Geometrie zu Grundlegen, which translates to On the Hypothesis that Formed the Foundations of Geometry, and boy, did it live up to its title. In the remarkable paper, Riemann introduced yet another formulation of non-Euclidean geometry. But here's where it gets super interesting. His system wasn't just a twist on Euclid's geometry. It was different from the ones created by Bolyai and Lobachevsky as well. You see, while Euclid had only postulated one parallel line through a point not on the line, Bolyai and Lobachevsky had allowed for more. Riemann, however, took things in a completely new direction with his elliptical geometry. He postulated that there are no lines parallel to a given line through a point not on it. And here's the kicker, all lines in his geometry were a finite length. To help you visualize this, think about a globe. All the meridians, those lines of longitude, converge at the poles. This concept was at the heart of Riemann's revolutionary ideas. In his paper, Riemann posed some thought-provoking questions about what type of geometry represented the real space we live in. And this marked the beginning of the idea that non-Euclidean geometry might have physical meaning. Riemann's work was a game-changer, and it was a pivotal moment in the history of mathematics. It opened up new doors of exploration, making us question the very nature of the space around us. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is why Riemann is celebrated as one of the great mathematical minds of all time. But just when people thought they knew everything there was to know about geometry, mathematicians like Felix Klein suggested there was more to it. Klein's big contribution to this field was a groundbreaking idea. He proposed that both good old Euclidean geometry and those mind-bending non-Euclidean geometries of Lobachevsky and Riemann are just special cases of something grander. What's that grander thing? Well, it's a more general discipline known as projective geometry. Now, what's projective geometry all about? It's like the ultimate geometry blender, mixing and matching different geometries. Geometries can be classified by the types of transformations and the mathematical tricks you can pull without messing up any of the theorems. The more transformations a geometry can handle without breaking, the more general it is. Projective geometry is all about properties like figuring out when points all lie on the same plane or when a bunch of lines meet at a single point. These properties are like the rock stars of projective geometry, and they stay cool no matter how much mathematical rock and roll happens around them. Projective can handle a more extensive range of transformations than the kind we're used to in good old Euclidean geometry. You know, stuff like making sure angles, lengths, and areas all stay the same. Hermann Minkowski, a mathematical pioneer from the late 19th century, did something truly extraordinary. He expanded our understanding of geometry by adding a fourth dimension to our usual three-dimensional space. The new geometric system, often referred to as the Minkowski space, includes time as the fourth dimension. So, imagine this. We're used to thinking about space in three dimensions, but Minkowski took it to a step further by including time as the fourth dimension. It was like adding an entirely new layer to the mathematical universe. Now, what makes this extra dimension so mind-boggling is that it set the stage for Albert Einstein's groundbreaking general theory of relativity. In general relativity, we don't think of gravity as a force between two masses, like in Newtonian physics. Instead, it's described as the curvature of space-time. Imagine a rubber sheet with grid lines, like a piece of graph paper laid flat. That's like our flat space in Euclidean geometry where everything is nice and straight. Imagine placing a heavy ball on that rubber sheet. What happens? The rubber sheet stretches and curves around the ball, and the grid lines are no longer straight. This curvature represents the effect of gravity on space and time. And here's where it gets truly mind-bending. 
The description of this curved spacetime, where gravity becomes a matter of geometry, was made possible by Minkowski space and the work of 19th century mathematicians who dare to consider that there might be geometries beyond Euclid's. So, when you think about the mind-blowing concept of spacetime, where time is woven into the very fabric of space itself, you can thank brilliant minds like Hermann Minkowski and Albert Einstein for pushing the boundaries of what we thought was possible in mathematics and physics. We may never have known this shape of our universe if mathematicians had not questioned and attempted to answer the fifth postulate of Euclid. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is how the exploration of new geometries can lead to some of the most profound discoveries in the universe. Thanks for joining us today, and I'll see you on our next math adventure.